We are live. Greetings, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. My name is Rob Bertram. I'm the Chief Scientist in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. And we are co-organizing this event today with uh, a series of partners. We're very excited to, to be at this event and we're very grateful to the AGRA uh, AGRF Summit for, for hosting this event. We're co-organizing it with the World Bank, the Africa Development Bank, the regional networks of agricultural policy research institutes, the Alliance for African Partnership. And I'm happy to say it is also co-convened uh, 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 by the board, US presidentially appointed Board on International Food and Agricultural Development or BIFAD. So it's a great opportunity to see the convergence, I think, of thinking emanating from Africa that is really driving attitudes and decisions and aspirations in places like the United States, the World Bank, and, and elsewhere, uh, that all of whom you know, are, are development partners in this overall effort. Um, our title, as you see, is Sustainable and Resilient Food Systems. Um, I think to talk about sustainability and, and resilience, we need to focus on those key drivers of growth and investment and how those can deliver on food security, on, on poverty reduction, on in improvements in nutrition, in ways that are both sustainable and that, that strengthen and grow the food systems in ways that make it more resilient to shocks or the vagaries of, of climate, uh, other kinds of economic dislocations. I think uh, a fundamental for a vibrant food system is, uh, is investment that drives productivity and innovation that drive productivity growth. Uh, we're going to hear about how these things are, are really taking us forward and helping us to achieve the, the sustainable development goals this morning. The second point I'd like to share is that nothing is more persuasive to development partners, certainly I can speak for USAID, and I think this is probably applicable to the private sector as well, than country leadership and commitment. Uh, this idea that, that our partner countries themselves are, are showing the way, are guiding all their partners, public and private sector, it globally and locally to locally in, in coming together around a vision for strengthened food systems, more resilient food systems, productive food systems and sustainable food systems that deliver on our human outcomes, the reduction in poverty, the reduction in malnutrition, and the opportunity, and even things like you know, gender equity, absolutely a critical piece to consider here, and other kinds of inclusion. Um, so this is really about, I think at the end of the day, uh, sound policy and policy implementation, co-investment, so exciting when a, a donor partner is co-investing with a partner for, in a country and transparency and predictability of markets and regulatory systems that are really crucial to driving all kinds of private sector and public sector decisions. And all of this adds up to leadership. So I think what we're seeing here now is, is a vision and I hope this, I think this will emerge this morning for a redoubling African leadership in this last 10 years as we race towards the SD. DGs that really can deliver on, on uh, where we need to be as a, for the continent and for the globe by 2030. Now, I've talked for several minutes without having mentioned COVID, but obviously uh, that has been a huge shock to the food system. And I think, again, the ultimate message there is that growth and robust growth and investment in agriculture and across the food system is going to be key to being able to both recover from that shock, but also uh, uh, strengthen the resilience of the food system going forward, whether we're talking ec economic shocks, climate shocks, or God forbid, another, uh, uh, another uh, issue like COVID. Our speakers today are going to share their vision on what that African leadership and self-determination will look like, spanning nationals, uh, sub-regional and global levels. They will discuss what is working, uh, what isn't, where do we need to do better, 
They'll explore the role of enabling environment, policy, governance, roads, grid, the role of research and innovation. And I think, and I know conveying a sense of optimism. Africa is home to some of the fastest growing economies in the world, including in the agricultural sector. And because it's starting at a relatively lower base, the opportunity for gains are the greatest of any region in the world. And with that, the opportunity for changing people's lives in tangible, meaningful, visible ways. So this is, this is a perfect opportunity uh, uh, to, to see what innovation, policy and commitment and leadership can do. So I'd like now to turn it over to our moderator. I'm delighted that uh, we are uh, going to be led this morning by Professor Richard Makondawire. Professor Makondawire is the African Director of Alliance for the African Partnership and Chairperson of the Malawi Planning Commission. As many of you know, uh, Richard was also a senior advisor, advisor to uh, the new Partnership for Africa's Development, NAPAD, and was the principal architect in the design of the Comprehensive Agricultural Africa Development Program, or CADA, which has been, I think, for this entire century thus far, one of the singular most effective and influential changes that we've seen on the African landscape. He was really, I think you can say, the heart and soul of CADAP. So it's with great pleasure now that I turn the floor over to our moderator, Professor Richard Makondawire. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Rob, for those uh, introductory remarks. Uh, I think you have uh, you know, laid out uh, pretty well the purpose of this uh, engagement, uh, the purpose of this uh, discussion, uh, but maybe just to emphasize that uh, we're extremely delighted, uh, those of us uh, from the Africa side uh, in welcoming um, you know, panelists as well as uh, participants from uh, across uh, the globe and those uh, from uh, Africa. Uh, we truly believe that uh, we need a coalition of the willing uh, from both uh, uh, the global north as well as uh, the global south and more particularly in, in Africa in addressing uh, these uh, challenges that are confronted in the transformation of uh, agriculture, agriculture in Africa, and uh, more particularly in looking at uh, this question of uh, resilience and sustainable food systems in Africa. And we trust that uh, through this uh, discussion, uh, we'll be able to reflect upon uh, some of the critical policy interventions that we can uh, you know, uh, put in front of uh, our governments across Africa as well as our partners to really begin to move uh, uh, the transformation agenda, um, which has been rather elusive uh, for a lot of our countries. Um, and uh, we're very, very keen in, of course, listening uh, uh, to some of uh, our key uh, panelists, including uh, our keynote speaker, uh, whom we, I will introduce shortly, um, on uh, you know, what are some of the you know, lessons emerging from different uh, countries, um, you know, any opportunities for successes, um, you know. So, so the, the, this we trust will be quite exciting uh, conversation. And I would like to, um, you know, engage our participants. Uh, please introduce yourselves, um, you know, uh, from wherever you are and whatever position you have. Uh, at the same time, feel free to raise any of the questions that uh, you feel are pertinent uh, to this uh, discussion, which uh, addresses uh, issues of resilience and sustainable um, agriculture transformation uh, in Africa. Uh, but before I, I call upon uh, Keith uh, as our keynote uh, presenter, I just want to raise one or two uh, critical issues uh, that are based on uh, my journey in the kind of process and uh, the current work I'm involved in particular with uh, the Malau government, uh, the, the time, you know, we really need to begin to uh, address some of those issues. Um, you know, one of the critical issues, which I, I very much hope uh, we will you know, reflect upon, again, participants and everybody else, is uh, you know, uh, why are we failing to convince our governments uh, to pursue or to commit themselves uh, to those policies that uh, would drive transformation on the ground, uh, that would drive sustainable agricultural 
uh, food systems on the on the ground. Um, you know, there are good policies which are you know have been uh, uh, churned out by research institutions, CG centers, owners. Uh, you know, um, including uh, policy related work. Um, besides, uh, of course, some technologies that have been generated by the various uh, research institutes. But why are we failing uh, to convince the governments maybe to invest or really to uh, move towards uh, the necessary uh, policy reforms? Uh, that, that's absolutely critical. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, you know, we, we need, I think, uh, to look beyond what we've been doing uh, and uh, re reflect hard whether or not uh, we're really targeting on uh, the right uh, individuals or perhaps are we the right individuals uh, who have been doing research for years uh, to be getting across to governments these are policies? Are there new ways of actually reaching better to, to governments? Uh, have we considered, for example, using civil society organizations, particularly you know, the more powerful voices that have emerged recently, whether they're youth voices or whether the women's voices, the various women's groups that are, are central to agriculture transformation and they're doing great work in their own right, but uh, you know, if these are not sufficiently armed with the information, they're sufficiently empowered, uh, it is difficult really for them to convince governments. So one of my pleas, and uh, I've raised it at a number of other occasions that uh, perhaps uh, we are actually ignoring a very important uh, you know, client here, uh, a very important group, uh, both in terms of allowing them to be armed with the right information in engaging governments. So I think this question of you know, defining new tactics in reaching out to governments is absolutely uh, fundamental. Um, as I said, I mean, let me again hasten to add that uh, you know, it is our hope as we actually continue with this conversation that uh, you know, we will actually mobilize a coalition of the willing, again, based on uh, uh, our experiences, and in my case more particularly, working with a whole range of global partners, it's become very evident that uh, you need, I think, a coalition of global partners, you need a coalition of African partners working together to really exert uh, pressure on uh, governments, uh, to exert pressure on uh, you know, the international community, uh, to really work together. The many, many partners who are committed to the agriculture transformation agenda and I think it's these collective voices that will make a difference on the ground. Uh, so it is my hope that uh, we will actually, you know, continue with this coalition beyond this conversation, because that's what, uh, you know, uh, drives change by, you know, uh, quickly moving towards uh, one voice. Um, without further ado, allow me uh, to call upon uh, our keynote uh, presenter, uh, who is uh, Keith, uh, Fagil, who is a senior economist with the United States Department of Agriculture Economic Research Service. Uh, his work focuses on the economics of agriculture, technical change, science, policy, and productivity growth. He also previously served as a senior economist for agriculture and natural resources on the White House Council of Economic Advisors. So Keith will present uh, uh, you know, an outline of uh, some of the uh, key uh, research uh, products that uh, came from uh, the work by, you know, BFAD, as well as a uh, World Bank report, and also the work from the African Development Bank. Again, addressing some of these many challenges that are, uh, you know, the African continent, African nations continue to confront, uh, to be confronted with, as uh, they make efforts in building resilient and sustainable agriculture food systems. So let me pass over to Keith uh, to give that uh, uh, you know, key note, which will set the scene going forward. Uh, Keith? Thank you very much, Richard. And uh, again, it's an honor and privilege for me to be able to join you this morning. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, what I would like to do today is just highlight some of the key findings from two recent reports that have come out of Washington, one by from the World Bank uh, and the other by BFAD or BIFAD, which is an advisory panel for USAID. Uh, next slide, please. 
So what these reports do is they offer some insight, I think, into what some of the major development and donor organizations are learning about the role of agriculture and agricultural productivity in building inclusive and resilient economies. In particular, they try, you know, they call these reports draw on academics to synthesize what we're learning uh, from recent economic research, what's relevant really in 2020. The world has changed obviously over the past decades. So the World Bank uh, report is really probably their, their first major uh, report on agricultural development since the 2008 World Development Report. And it really focuses on strategies to raise agricultural productivity in developing countries. The USAID BIFAD report focuses specifically on Africa and um, is designed to inform USAID on its agricultural development strategies for that region. And it gives particular attention to building economic resilience, the ability to withstand and recover from economic shocks. So let me get right into it. Uh, next slide uh, and focus on six major findings that come that emerge from from these two studies. And one is uh, and this is, you know, just to echo what Rob said earlier in his opening remarks that Africa has made major economic progress over the last two decades. Per capita income rose, poverty rates have fallen, health, education, life expectancy, and other social indicators have improved. Uh, next slide. Uh, a second finding is that agriculture played a major role in this uh, emerging uh, economic transformation in Africa. And what agriculture offers to economic development is inclusive growth, because when agriculture grows, farmers' incomes rise and consumers become better off when they have available to them more abundant and, uh, and lower cost food. And, and in that way, agricultural growth really benefits broadly across society, reducing poverty more than growth in other sectors, as well as improving nutrition. And indeed, agricultural growth stimulates non-agricultural growth. And that's really the process of this economic transformation that, that we're talking about. And agricultural growth builds resilient economies. And we've seen this in particular in the COVID-19 pandemic, which threw the world and African economies into recession. But despite that, the agricultural sector continued to grow. It was one of the most resilient sectors of the economy in the face of this shock. Next slide. A third finding, however, is that progress has been uneven amongst African countries. Next slide. And the BIFAD report in particular talks about four groups of African countries, fragile states, which have, have been in persistent conflict over the past couple of decades, resource rich countries, which rely heavily on natural resource extraction for exports, mainly from oil, gas and minerals, and then the low and low and middle income countries. And the fragile states and resource rich countries actually have done the poorest in terms of uh, social indicators showing improvement in, in the, their, the livelihoods of their people. Fragile states, of course, when you're in conflict, it's very difficult to get the institutions in place to stimulate growth. Resource rich countries have also faced uh, challenges. Not only does it uh, stimulate, in some cases, um, create conflict within countries as different groups compete for those for, the, for those rents from those resources. In fact, many of the fragile states are also uh, resource rich countries, um, but also resource rich countries, if, 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 that, if, the, if those export earnings are not managed carefully, it can lead to overvalued exchange rates, macroeconomic instability and uh, discourage or, or um, uh, lower returns to other sectors, especially tradable sectors like, like agriculture and discourage investment in those sectors. So the countries that really have done the best are the lower middle income countries, as well as some of the low income countries. And um, much of the strategy on agriculture really reviews what's going on in these countries and what these countries can do to move agriculture ahead in these reports. Next slide. So a fourth 
uh, finding, however, is that agriculture's, agri uh, Africa's current agricultural growth path, though it has been better than in the past, is not sustainable. It has depended too heavily on expanding land area and other resources in production rather than raising the productivity of those resources. Next slide. And I'd like to just uh, bring out one of the charts that occurs in these reports to help illustrate this. And what these uh, bars show is, um, and focus first on the middle bar for Sub-Saharan Africa, they show the average annual growth rate in real output of agriculture. The first one, the three decades prior to 1990, and the second one, the three decades since 1990. And you can see that Africa, yes, the uh, agricultural growth did expand from less than 2% to over 3% on average over this period. And that significantly improved conditions for people and growth in these economies. But then the colors of those bars show where that growth came from. And in Africa's case, most of that growth came from land expansion. Some of it came and, and relatively little came from improving yield. And in, pick, in particular, we focus on that green part, which we call total factor productivity, which is really an indicator of how fast and how rapid is technology uh, changing and efficiency changing to raise the productivity of all the land, labor, and capital resources employed in agriculture. And that TFP-led growth, that productivity-led growth, it really gets driven by investments in research and the development and policies that encourage an enabling environment for the rapid dissemination and adoption of technologies to raise innovation and productivity and agriculture. And, and if you compare that with, with Africa's experience with all developing countries, you see that other developing countries are making this transition to productivity-led growth. More than half of their growth over the, in agriculture over the last three decades has come from this TFP or total factor productivity. Africa continues to lag behind this in this, in this transformation, which, which is really key to accelerating and sustaining growth over the long term. Uh, next slide. The report Harvesting Prosperity actually goes into quite a bit of detail on what can go into a successful productivity-led uh, growth strategy for countries. And at the core of that are these national investments in agricultural research and development. And then surrounding that is the different elements of an enabling environment. Of course, agricultural extension is a critical component. And there are new, new opportunities to use e-extension and, and um, information and communication technologies to reach more farmers more quickly at lower costs. And of course, it's not, and of course, for farmers who are raising their productivity and adopting the new technology need connection and access to markets. And so investments in market access and infrastructure, as well as stable macroeconomic policies and agricultural policies, at least that don't discriminate against agriculture, are important to stimulate and make profitable investments by farmers in productivity. Basic education, land tenure security, access to credit, and some means for reducing uh, risks inherent in agriculture are also key elements uh, of an enabling environment to stimulate rapid dissemination and innovation, dissemination of technologies and innovation in agriculture. Uh, next slide. Now we see actually in some countries emerging evidence that this kind of egg innovation strategy works in African conditions. And we'd like to focus on two countries in particular that we think we see evidence that this is really taking off. Next slide. The first is Ethiopia. And Ethiopia, as you know, emerged in the 1990s after several decades of conflict, one of the poorest countries of the world with large numbers of its people facing food insecurity. It, it was able to reestablish political and macroeconomic stability, and it launched an explicit policy of what it called agricultural-led industrialization. And since the 1990s, Ethiopia has been able to grow agriculture at over 5% per year in real terms. Now, a lot of that has come from bringing new land and 
and resources into production, but we see this productivity led growth raising the productivity of those resources uh, also making a significant contribution to that acceleration in growth. And what that achieved or what that helped contribute to on the right hand side figure are significant reductions in poverty, malnutrition and food insecurity. Again, demonstrating how agricultural growth creates these broad shared inclusive benefits across the economy. Next slide. Another emerging success story is Ghana, which really since the 1980s uh, implemented uh, a series of economic and political reforms that stimulated private sector investment and agricultural growth. And since over the last three or four decades has been able to maintain agricultural growth rates again of almost 5% per year on average. And especially over the last decade, increasing amount of that growth is coming through productivity, through adoption of new technologies, new farming systems, sometimes new commodities and value added activities to raise uh, productivity of farm and rural resources. And even in Northern Ghana, the traditionally the poorest part of the country, we've seen agricultural growth take place. And in a relatively short period of time and say one decade, rates of extreme poverty and child malnutrition being cut in half. So we see evidence here that this kind of strategy works and is possible even in very widely differing conditions such as the Ethiopian highlands and the Guinea savanna of northern Ghana. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, well, we can ask ourselves, what were the key policies that these countries uh, implemented to get this kind of sustained uh, growth and leading to productivity led growth. Again, I mentioned political and macroeconomic stability, but it, very critical for agriculture were investments in agricultural innovation. Both countries significantly increased spending on agricultural research development, and Ethiopia has built the largest agricultural extension system in Africa. Both countries liberalized markets, allowing prices to signal to producers how to allocate resources uh, in efficient ways. And both countries have invested significant resources in rural infrastructure, rural roads to connect farmers uh, to markets. And in each case, the, the, this has been a smallholder led agricultural uh, growth process uh, emerging. Uh, finally, uh, last slide um, um, is, um, well, I guess there's one slide before this, but this is fine. Uh, this, I just wanted to point out that these uh, reports are free to download. Um, there's, um, and there's, they're chock full of, of charts and figures and tables and references to the literature that expand on these points, as well as draw in other points that I think are relevant for the AGRIF 2021 summit and today's discussion. So thank you very much for this opportunity to contribute to this uh, pre-summit event. And uh, Richard, I'd like to turn the floor back to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Keith, for setting the scene and highlighting uh, both uh, progress as well as uh, challenges that uh, many countries face in pursuit of uh, agricultural transformation and economic growth. Um, as you rightly said, I mean, uh, progress has been uneven and indeed there are quite a few uh, performing countries, star performing countries. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we need to raise questions uh, which are key in terms of, uh, you know, what is actually, you know, happening to these other countries what is it these kind what have these countries done as you began to, to highlight uh, and uh, what decisions should african governments other african governments take uh, uh you know differently and how should they invest differently as well to make their food systems more resilient and sustainable as we're seeing from some of these uh, you know rather you know smaller numbers of countries which seem to be doing uh, very very well um, so I, I would like to now introduce the next panelists that I will respond to that question. Uh, they will amplify on uh, the issues you have raised, um, but more importantly, they will really respond to this question on uh, what decisions should these African governments take 
you know, uh, differently? And how should they invest differently to make their food systems more resilient and uh, uh, sustainable? Um, first, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Talham Amede, uh, who is the head of our resilience and soils unit at AGRA. Uh, he has actually worked in a number of other institutions before uh, he came to AGRA, including uh, ICRISAT, uh, IRI, SIAT, among many others. Uh, he also teaches uh, as an associate professor at uh, Azababa University. Uh, the second uh, panelist is uh, uh, Professor Kevin Rama, uh, who is currently senior director of the African Development Institute and formerly senior advisor to the president of the African Development Bank, as well as uh, the inaugural managing director of the Quantum Global Research Lab. Uh, many of us have worked with him uh, as a real, um, you know, a top thought leader uh, in addressing the challenges and opportunities uh, around uh, agriculture transformation uh, in, the, in the continent. Uh, the other one I would like to introduce on the panel is uh, Ms. Lama Ndibogo uh, Trab, um, who is currently the chairperson of the technical committee of the Regional Network of Agriculture Policy Research Institutes, RINAPRI. Uh, this is an African agriculture-led uh, institution coordinating a group of uh, national agriculture policy research in institutes across Africa. It resides in uh, uh, South Africa, and uh, he's actually conducting also research with the Bureau for Food and Agriculture Policy, uh, BFAB. Uh, she is also a, a dual a citizen of uh, the, the US as well as uh, South Africa. Uh, the next panelist is uh, John Olawande. Uh, he has over 15, 14 years experience in economic and policy research in the agriculture and rural development sector. Uh, he has worked uh, uh, for a number of years with uh, Tagameo uh, Research Institute. And uh, he is actually part of uh, uh, the consortium of uh, researchers who are working with Michigan State University uh, to support um, agriculture transformation uh, across the continent with a particular focus on a, a fertilizer uh, and soil health issues. Uh, so that, that is actually the, the first set of uh, uh, panelists uh, whom I'd like to turn over uh, to really respond to this important question. Uh, what decisions should governments take differently and how should they invest differently to make their food systems more resilient and sustainable. Um, we, we can uh, uh, start with um, um, maybe uh, Kevin Orama from the African Development Institute. You have worked with our governments, uh, but also you've worked with our research institutions. And now you are actually working at the African Development Bank leading this uh, research uh, institute. Uh, again, you know, part of your challenge is really to uh, engage governments uh, on how base they can actually begin to address these issues uh, differently uh, to ensure that uh, uh, they make their food system more resilient and sustainable. Uh, so over to you, um, um, Kevin. Thank you very much, um, Richard. And uh, thanks to all the colleagues, the panelists, and also the delegates. Uh, it's a big pleasure to be asked to speak on this very important topic um, that is very crucial for sustainable development and inclusive growth transitions um, in Africa. For me, let me start with basically summarizing what I've heard from the, the keynote uh, to drive home the key recommendations that we would like to put forward based on conversations we've had in the global community of practice seminars of the African Development um, uh, Bank held uh, last year. Um, so first uh, point there is that building resilience and sustainable agriculture is not uh, a linear approach. It is something that requires um, a, a, a holistic systems thinking. We heard him talking about investing in infrastructure. We heard him talking about macroeconomic stability and we've heard him talking about investing in research and education, uh, extension, and so on. That is one point. Then the other point for me is the fact that building this resilience in agriculture and agri-food systems in Africa 
is imperative for growth in Africa, and it's also imperative for sustainable development globally. Um, this point really came out very clearly from all the research that also has been um, uh, presented by him. Then the third point is investing in local capacity for knowledge and technology development, innovation, uh, division, adaptation, and, trans and transmission on the continent, extension services, and so on. These things are fundamental for agricultural transformation that has happened across the world, and Africa's is not going to be different. If you look at the statistics, we're not doing that very well, uh, especially in investing in capacity and innovation for uh, agriculture on the continent. We focus quite a lot on uh, importing the inputs and also a lot of the implements that we are, I mean, technologies that are required for agricultural transformation on the continent. And what that creates for governments is that the rent from the growth that we're seeing may not be coming to Africa. And that is why Africa is still spending quite a lot uh, in importing the food to feed uh, its citizens. From these three key points I raised comes the few recommendations I would like to make for African governments to think about. The first one is, I don't really think we need new policies because Africa has come up with very sound policies before that we just need to implement. One of the uh, key ones that address goes to the heart of those enablers for uh, agricultural transformation in Africa is investing in research and development and extension services. It's just to recall that in the Maputo Declaration, the governments of the continent had agreed to uh, invest at least 10% of their budget to this sector. That would be the first place to start. Let's just implement that which you have already agreed to because we see that it is fundamental for agricultural transformation everywhere in the world. So let's try and get that done. Then the second one for me would be to support what I'll choose to call national agricultural innovation systems. Uh, each country to actually look at this whole ecosystem that will allow to make agriculture a productive business. Then we'll find the youths, very innovative set of people in, in, in Africa, the women and everyone will invest in agriculture because that, if you have the framework conditions that national innovation systems provide, agriculture will become a, a productive business. The agri-food systems will become productive businesses and you will find both the private sector, both local and international private sector, jumping into it and making it to work. And we need to prioritize, for me, another key thing is investing in digitization of agriculture so that we can leapfrog, just as we have done in the mobile telephony sector and in other sectors, that we can see that that will help us to leapfrog in improving our impact in terms of growing value and improving the value addition along the whole value chain. And finally, I would suggest that we need to think home a lot more in terms of building regional and national agricultural value chains and strengthening trade, intra-trade um, in, in agricultural products on the continent. Uh, before I stop, I would like to make a recommendation for bilateral development agencies and development finance institutions. We need to consider establishing an agricultural science, technology, and innovation fund for Africa because without really giving that push on local technology development, ad technology adaptation, technology sharing, it will be really difficult for us to compete uh, or even to reap economic rents that comes for agricultural um, transformation on the con continent. And then with that comes investing in institutional capacity for Africa, African youth, African women, African state institutions, to be able to do agricultural transformation as we have seen in the rest of the world. And with that, my five minutes is over. I'll come back with other points. Thank you. I yield back to you, Richard. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Um, you, you're raising a very controversial issue there around uh, you know, maybe no need for more policies. Uh, perhaps uh, Lulama uh, may wish to come in here uh, from uh, the work you're doing with uh, these uh, regional policy research institutes. And perhaps, uh, uh, you know, reflect again on uh, that particular uh, recommendation, um, you know, whether 
you know, maybe we just need to implement towards implementation. Um, do you think that uh, we have uh, sufficient, uh, you know, policies that are, you know, they just need to be implemented? Um, Lulama? Right. Thank you, Prof. Uh, yeah, and thank you for that question. I agree wholeheartedly with Kevin. We definitely have good policies. I think the real issue is about implementation. And so getting back to also the original question of what African governments can do differently, I think, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about this as we were preparing for this session, I think I want to take us back like Kevin did to some of the key points that Keith had raised in his presentation. And the first point is this positive messaging from the BIFED and the World Bank report. As Keith pointed out with his first key finding, Africa has made tremendous economic progress over the past two decades. And we really should celebrate that win because at some level it indicates that our leaders are getting it right. Now, albeit not everyone, but at least some of them. And that's why I really appreciated Keith taking us through the case study on Ethiopia and Ghana, because in my opinion, it appears that they are getting it right. So to answer this question then of what can African governments do differently? Well, maybe the different approach would be to actually learn from each other. And as we were preparing for this, uh, this session, one of the points that Kevin, you had raised earlier was this, this on the African peer review mechanism. And so I went about trying to you know, research this and what is this? And what I understood is that this is an existing platform that has been designed to facilitate and monitor and evaluate um, each other's progress. So why not use this existing platform to monitor and evaluate our progress? right, towards building resilience and sustainability in our food system. And the second thing I think that our governments can do differently is to really amplify the African voice in this movement towards building resilience and sustainability. As Keith indicated, going forward, it is, as a continent, it's going to be critical that we transition from a resource dependent to productivity led agricultural growth. Right, this, this status quo, it's not sustainable, both environmentally and socially. But to do this effectively means that we need to develop locally adaptive technologies and innovations. So to truly make this a local endeavor will require our national governments increasing their investments on agriculture, R, D, and E. And I know in previous conversations, even with Kevin, you've raised this point of our governments need to not necessarily wait on donor uh, partners or development partners to make this investment, but we need to step up and make this investment on our own behalf. So to end then, or to wrap up my five minutes, I would really like to challenge our leaders because if we wanna get down to concrete specifics on implementation, I would like to challenge our leaders then to really achieve the target of 1% of agricultural GDP being invested in agriculture R, D and E. It will help us amplify our African voices. So with that then Richard, I'd like to turn it over to you and thank you. Well, thank you very much, Luloma, uh, for amplifying again uh, some of those uh, uh, critical issues uh, which uh, were raised by uh, Kevin. Um, yeah, maybe we can uh, go to uh, Tilahum and John. Um, you know, what should we be doing really to, to, to turn the tide for those countries which are probably uh, are not really, um, you know, moving? Uh, whether it is uh, on uh, investing in uh, research and development or whether it is uh, really uh, responding some of the flawed policies, those policies which we know that they're not working, the bad policies, um, you know, why, I mean, wh what is the best way of engaging them? Um, you know, what approaches and tactics uh, can we uh, put in place to engage them into action and translating some of the known evidence into more effective policy and implementation, um, you know, um, by actually, you know, drawing them to the to their drawing to their attention some of the successes which uh, their neighboring countries have actually, you know, 
you know, um, achieved, um, you know, the cases of Ethiopia, cases of Rwanda, uh, cases of Ghana, um, you know, what would be the tactics uh, or approaches we should be using to really convince them as researchers, as, you know, uh, development partners, uh, as global, uh, you know, thought leaders uh, on the ground, or indeed even we as a coalition, any ideas on how best we can actually engage some of these governments into action? Uh, so uh, to you, um, uh, Tilahan and uh, John, yeah. maybe you can respond. Tilahan, sure, first. sure. Yeah, uh, good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, uh, Richard and colleagues. I have enjoyed um, also the, the keynote and uh, one thing which is really coming very clearly from Keza's presentation is a yield gap. So even countries which we thought have progressed over time in terms of productivity and producing more food and reducing uh, poverty, Ethiopia and Ghana, you know, here are hugely relying on um, you know, land expansion. And that land expansion is usually happening as an expense of the ecosystems, you know, uh, you, you know, farmers replace forests, wetlands, water towers, and degrade them. Uh, and the current data shows that about 17% of African agriculture, I mean, African landscape is degraded exactly because of that. Uh, and upon that, then we have the climate issue, which is bring us to drought, you know, unreliable rainfall, both in amount and distribution, but also in the same countries, we struggle with frequent floods, you know, and now increasing trend. So, uh, you know, the issue is how do you make a country, you know, resilient and sustainable unless those countries are managing their resource base uh, better? So really managing the land, managing the water, managing the, the vegetation, so that you know those systems are then responsive to inputs, are producing more per unit of investment and labor, but also are you know less uh, less, less affected by 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 risks. Uh, and as a solution, you know we we in Agra have been talking about this for a while and talking about what we call sustainable farming, really you know, following agroecology-based circular systems along with, you know, judicious application of inputs to address the multiple goals and challenges we have in the continent, which are productivity, you know, low productivity. We should move out of really one ton, uh, 1.5 ton agriculture. Farmers should get profit out of it, but also our system must be resilient. Uh, and, uh, one key really investment policymakers should do to minimize this risk besides really resource management is investment in, in, in agriculture, water infrastructure, in capturing the water resources we have in the continent, in storing them and in efficiently utilizing them. Uh, by doing that, you know, farmers then can adapt technologies because 90% of our farmers are rain fed and most farmers are not using the inputs, uh, the varieties because of risk of crop failure. And there is also now a, a lot of progress in terms of energy, you know, renewable energy is coming in, solar energy, solar power for water lifting is now becoming available. These are areas where really investment can go to improve, you know, uh, the productivity and minimize the yield gap. Along with, of course, the traditional inputs like seed systems, improved extension systems, along with marketing incentives um, and, and capacity. I think the bigger picture, uh, I mean, uh, that uh, the, the, the keynote speaker show, capacity in research, capacity in development and extension is again really a major you know, uh, investment required because even if we have technology and practices which are operating at farm and landscape scales in a certain system, unless farmers have access to the information and to the technology, you know, we will keep preaching, but nothing will happen at the scale. And this has to reach in terms of farming system-based targeting. 
The next uh, investment I thought, you know, policymakers should go for is small scale mechanization in the continent. You know, the current uh, really um, farming system is largely who based, labor intensive, you know, starting from land preparation through weeding, through threshing, through cultures and all the processes. So, you know, people are investing so much time you know, on, on agriculture and are, you know, using it inefficiently. Uh, and uh, because of, you know, lack of really mechanization. And there's a lot of experience, uh, you know, in, Af in, in, in India, in China, whereby small scale mechanization has brought about a lot of change. When you have who, you know, uh, plows, you are just touching the, the surface soil the, and uh, you create a soil crust. So you cannot keep you know, water in the, in the soil. So you expose the crops to drought. But also you could plow only limited land. If you go to, you know, like countries like Zambia or particularly Mozambique, farmers have a lot of land, but the amount of land they plow is quarter of a hectare because they don't have the, you know, the energy and they don't have the mechanization option to, to, to plow more land. But also, you know, the post-harvest losses we encounter in the continent, some countries like in Ethiopia are saying 30 to 50 percent of the food is lost because of lack of you know, post-harvest you know, technologies trans during transportation, storage processing, and all that is really required. So in general, really investment in, in, in small scale mechanization, investment, but also you know, not only in the machinery, but also uh, in, in, in the local capacity to maintain it. You know, you can bring in, in, in machinery in the villages, a very small, um, you know, uh, spare part can stop everything. So what coming up now at the lesson is really, you know, considering the use, train them, give them the basic facility as service providers, for example, in irrigation farming, whereby they help farmers, you know, to repair them all their, uh, you know, um, water pumps uh, and making sure that they are not uh, buying a water, a water pump, you know, uh, on a yearly basis. And all this, of course, you know, needs investment. So capital is very important. Finance, access to finance is very important. And I think there is an increasing interest, including us in, in Agra, we are promoting, you know, SMEs, uh, whereby really farmers and farmer groups can get access to to, um, you know, uh, loans, uh, but also, you know, as an investment areas from banks, uh, so that really farmers together can come and, you know, get the, the initial capital uh, to, to buy the most, this is the most important machineries and input so that they really can intensify the system. So in general, I think, uh, you know, uh, we need to move from extensive agriculture to sustainable intensification. We have to produce more per, per unit of land, but for that to happen, there's a need for inputs, there's a need for facilitation, for capacity building and mechanization. Over to you, uh, Richard. Well, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Tilahuni for your reflections on those very concrete uh, recommendations um, on uh, how we might, you know, deepen our engagements with uh, leaders. Um, you know, you have emphasized more particularly around our challenges, um, including, of course, access to financing, um, you know, around very concrete known uh, opportunities for, to, to succeed, um, a very important uh, issue you have raised. Um, can, can we uh, turn to John? I mean, John, can you reflect also on uh, the, the same question, um, you know, based on uh, some of the work you're doing uh, within Gameo Policy Research Institutes, uh, have you defined on how based you, you're able to engage leaders to take action um, in translating some of the excellent evidence that uh, you've generated from uh, that institute within Kenya? Uh, maybe give us some examples uh, on Kenya, which uh, has, make, has made remarkable progress 
um, in a number of you know, areas, particularly uh, in reaching out uh, to remote and difficult to reach uh, small farmers, uh, what tactics have you used to really convince governments to reach better to these uh, smallholder farmers? Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And uh, thank you, fellow panelists and participants. Um, yes, uh, a lot have been said about uh, what can be done in terms of uh, improving uh, the productivity and resilience uh, at the lower le levels of the value chain. And Kevin has also said that uh, perhaps what we don't need are uh, new policies, but what we need is how to implement those policies, which really require uh, engagement uh, with the policy makers. And uh, um, specifically to the question that Richard, you have posed to me, one of the things that I've found to be useful and helpful in reaching and convincing policy makers is first of all, having evidence that is based on high quality data. Um, uh, that speaks to the need uh, at present. That is very important if you want to convince uh, uh, policymakers. Another uh, uh, area that uh, we researchers should uh, pay attention to is how we generate that evidence. Uh, it is important that there is participation in the process of generating that evidence. And with the uh, um, problems becoming more complex and diverse and cut across sectors and disciplines, co-creation for evidence generation is very important. Uh, that co-creation should include both the researchers, the government agencies that are involved, the civil society organizations, and of course, the communities that are going to be affected by the recommendations that would come uh, from such uh, evidence. A third uh, important issue that uh, um, we need to pay attention to as especially researchers is consistency of the messages or the evidence that we put forth. Um, and this is important because if the evidence that we put forth to guide policies and to guide decisions by private sector and uh, by other players uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the agricultural space is not consistent, then we perhaps would not expect to see any progress in terms of uh, the uptake and implementation of the recommendation that come from uh, uh, such evidence. And all these require uh, um, a lot of partnerships, partnerships across uh, uh, disciplines, partnerships across institutions, not only locally, but uh, broadly across borders, um, um, across borders uh, within the continent and outside the continent. Uh, something that I've appreciated is the value of uh, working together with people from different uh, contexts, because through that you get to enrich the evidence that you put that you put forth. And of course, as I conclude, developing uh, effective communication strategies um, is very key to reaching uh, um, the policy makers and the implementers of the policies. Uh, technology is changing very rapidly, and therefore the pace at which also the researchers adapt uh, to the changing technological environment in terms of communicating the strategies, uh, communicating uh, the evidence that have been generated to the stakeholders is very, very important. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, John, for, for raising uh, those uh, critical issues. Uh, I think one of the issues we often forget is that uh, we have uh, a new crop of uh, African uh, leaders and uh, policy uh, decision makers. Many of them are educated. In fact, a number of countries, some of them are agriculturists. So putting evidence on the table for them, they're able to read and interpret that data and that evidence, and they're able to, to respond. Uh, I think very often we, we forget that. And uh, 
you know, so we need, I think, to generate, I think, quality evidence. Uh, I, I like, again, uh, your, your suggestion, uh, which uh, I had alluded to earlier on, that uh, we need, I think, to build partnerships. Uh, we need different voices uh, to get to these uh, decision makers. And indeed, I think uh, journalists and, uh, you know, communications experts are part of that, uh, I think, engagement process. Uh, but for them to actually be part of uh, the, that engagement process, they need also capacity uh, in uh, undertaking analytical work uh, so that uh, they can interpret the data and speak you know, professionally and convincingly as they engage uh, either the general public or indeed as they engage uh, those uh, decision makers. So John, uh, thank you very much, I think, for uh, highlighting some of those uh, critical uh, issues and tactics on uh, how based we might actually reach out to these uh, decision makers uh, to uh, uh, respond to uh, you know, some of the uh, policy evidences that uh, you, know, you might have generated to convince them to take action. Uh, let, let me turn to uh, Kevin and Lama uh, and uh, to continue, I think, to uh, raise the same question, um, but uh, more importantly, uh, by looking at the roles of policy research institutes to make policy makers understand the evidence and the trade-offs uh, you know, they're of course, I mean, you know, interested in uh, achieving their own political agendas. Um, but, uh, you know, how are you able to really, uh, as policy uh, research institutes, and indeed, Kevin, in your previous work, uh, you have been a policy analyst, and indeed, you have uh, supported government, you know, uh, how are you able to help these policymakers to understand the evidence and the trade-offs? Uh, and how can we encourage African uh, also led government, uh, Afri African led institu policy research institutes uh, to inform policy and policy implementation uh, on the continent? Uh, how can we encourage, in other words, governments uh, to use these uh, policy uh, research institutes to inform policy and policy implementation on uh, the continent? Um, so we, again, we can start with you, uh, maybe Lulama first. Um, okay, great. I thank you. you some work in that area. Yes. Well, no, thank you, Prof, for that. And thank you for that question. It's the one that keeps me up at night because to me, this is a million dollar question and it's going to take decades of investments to be able to address it. Um, but I don't think it's a question about, you know, how do we encourage African governments to use us? That th this isn't a question that our governments can answer. This is a question that our African based policy research think tanks need to answer. Because in my opinion, the onus is on us to prove our value add to our, um, to our policy makers and to our stakeholders that are involved in the system, right? So I think I've thought a bit about this and coming from my experience with a locally nationally based policy research think tank, we've had to compete with the likes of the McKinsey's of the world to get the ear of our national government. But we've been very strategic um, and our strategy, and it's taken us well over a decade to really put this in place, has been to ensure that we as an institution diversify our funding base. So we're not just getting funding from donor partners or private sector, but also from um, the public sector as well. We've also worked on collaborating with, on an equal footing with global institutions. And the third thing is we've built local capacity. So that's my intervention on that point. Thank you, Prof. Uh, th thank you, Lama, thank you. Um, um, and Kevin, uh, responding to the same question. Um... Okay. Thank you very much. I, I think Lolama said this scene very well. For me, the, the, the challenge for uh, African think tanks and policy research institutes, I will summarize in four words. One is relevance. How relevant are the research agendas that we pursue as policy research institutes to the development objectives of the countries and the development priorities of the countries at the moment? Because if we research the priorities of the countries, they will come for the results uh, of, of the research even before you finish. One of my research in Europe showed actually that if you engage proactively and do participatory research with member governments, you have already gotten policy adoption over 60%.
So that relevance is a very key thing. And it's also a big challenge for African uh, think tanks because quite often the funding comes from outside of Africa and then you have to meet the requirements of the donors. And sometimes those defined agendas may not be fully aligned with the current challenges that countries are grappling with. The second one is quality. How do we ensure that the quality of the research, the policy research, the methodology and everything are waterproof? So that it actually can start at par with the work that McKinsey will produce, the World Bank will produce, IMF will produce, Brookings Institute will produce, and African Development Bank and other global agencies will produce. So that's another challenge that we need to deal with. The other one is timeliness. Um, sometimes researchers take so much time to come up with the research to make sure that it is statistically robust, but polit policy decisions often happen on the fly. So how do we ensure that we are actually preempting what those policy decisions are and doing quality research so that we actually have ready-made answers when the policymakers come knocking at our doors? And then the final one is engagement, which John has clearly explained how to do it and how we can do it properly. Communication, how we communicate the research, the engagement in setting the agenda, and all those things are crucial. And for me, I always think of not only the how, but what we need to do. And to do this, I would like to request um, development, international development agencies, donors, and so on, to try and prioritize building Africa's capacity to do this, instead of doing it for Africa. If we have policy research institutes, as excellent ones trying to do a great job, we need a fund that will be able to support them to do this sustainably. And that is why the African Development Bank in its capacity development strategy that was approved just this last month by the board of directors, have a, a proposal to work on a knowledge and capacity development trust fund for Africa. So for donors who are listening, I would like to invite us to work together to make this work for Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Can I come in? Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, you wanted to add, uh... Um, yes. Yes. Yes, please. I'm, yeah, yeah, I just I'm wanted to, to add. Uh, I, I just wanted to add a few concepts here. Myself as a researcher, uh, you know, one thing uh, which I think policy and development research should do is a research on research. You know, we have technologies, specific technologies for specific targets, but farmers are much, you know, and farming systems are much more complex. So how do you bring the different components together and make them work? That's a research on research by itself, which is complex, which is context specific, and which, is, which should be tested and validated on the spot to convince policymakers that what we are bringing to the system is working. The second thing along with this is really, you know, demonstrating success at, at the local level, show policymakers with a deep dive on how to do it, now in a certain location within the system and use that as a building block in collaboration with the local actors to transform the culture systems so that they will be having a confidence to invest and to scale. I think that's a very important entry point for me. The third one I would like to advocate for is really core development, uh, particularly you know, donors, development partners with uh, you know, countries, ministries, so that they can leverage and influence the agenda to make sure that, you know, the system that is designed is sustainable and supported by evidence and knowledge. And the fourth, last one I would like to, to talk about is really support in, in, in scaling. You know, how do you take it to scale? There's still a lot of debate in the, in the research system. We don't still know the strategies so we advocate now for context specific, farming system specific, uh, you know, types of targeting. You know, Africa is too big, it's complex. We have 52 plus countries. We cannot try everything in every country. So can we consider a farming system based, like in you know, a pastoral, agro-pastoral based system, a maize based system, you know, a root based system, a tree based system, we develop those concepts, test them on the ground, 
and then avail them for scaling to the African governments. I think these are very important leverages that we can capitalize on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tarhan, uh, for, for that uh, addition. Um, let me move on to, to, to the last question uh, and ask any of the panelists who may have uh, uh, additional contributions uh, to make. And also perhaps in the process, uh, you, you can actually um, just you know, summarize your, 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 your takeaways uh, based on uh, this uh, conversation. Um, I think we all know that our food systems function according to the capacities of the individuals, organizations, and institutions engaged in these uh, systems. What can African governments and international development partners do to rapidly and sustainably improve the capacities of the government ministries and agencies to respond effectively to major shocks and stressors affecting African food systems? Can I go um, first, um, Richard? Yes, John, please, yeah. Yes, I have two issues that I think are critical. One of them has been uh, mentioned by uh, Kevin about the strengthening of the research capacity of local institutions. When their um, capacity is strengthened, they are able to respond to the needs of uh, the governments uh, to respond to such shocks and, and stresses. But one that I've seen and uh, observed is a critical area. It's on data uh, systems and data and information systems that are lacking. So there is need to support development and maintenance of adequate systems for data and uh, information gathering, processing, and sharing, because that is going to critically support uh, um, decision making, not only policy, but also uh, people uh, who would want to invest in the uh, ag value chain systems. Thank you. No, th thank you. Thank you. Um, Can I come in? Yes, Kevin, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, the point has been made before, and I want to re 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 restate it again. And it is the issue about access to finance. Um, our institutions are underfunded, and quite a lot of time, the heads of these institutions spend a lot of time chasing the resources and very little time to do the work. This comes out of a survey that we did in preparing the capacity development strategy of the bank. So one, one recommendation to help is actually to, because the cost of capital in Africa is also very high. So it would be useful if the development finance agencies can increase this access to capital and also find innovative ways of reducing the cost of capital. Um, to African institutions, so African government-led institutions, um, and also research-led institutions, uh, through partnerships and different ways that you can actually de-risk the financing schemes and, uh, that, that we have for these, uh, these agencies. That will help quite a lot to take their minds away from looking for money to survive, uh, to actually doing quality work uh, that is supposed to lead to agricultural transformation for the benefit of Africa, and as I said in my start, also for the benefit of global sustainability. Africa is the next food basket of the world, has 65% of the arable land remaining, uh, over, I mean, huge population, a lot of them youthful population providing good level, uh, that, that level market opportunities. Let's harness this for global sustainability by investing in them. Thank you. No, this is, thank you, Kevin. I'm sure a lot Can of- I come uh, in? We'll find that, uh, you know, as music in their ears. Um, do we, do we, Lulama, you'd like to, to come in again, or uh, is it a- Till I'm here, yeah. uh, Richard. Till yeah. home. Oh. Yes, um, I think two things. One, you know, there are many competitive approaches that are confusing our governments. If you see, you know, what, for example, people talk about resilience and climate change adaptation, we have these approaches of regenerative agriculture, agroecology, sustainable intensification, all these, you know, uh, and, and sustainable farming within Agra now. I think we have to agree on one approach which is plausible for Africa in context specific. 
so that we adapt a similar approach so that we can learn from each other and capitalize on our own experiences and resources. The second thing I would like to say is, uh, you know, our countries, they have own plans, you know? Countries have their own climate adaptation plans, transformation plans. So how do we help them? I think instead of bringing something new every time and, and you know, bringing alternative types of scenarios and approaches, why don't we work with our country's plans, their development plans, which are cascaded through the ministries and make sure that these plans are plausible and are applied and tested before moving to anything else. I think with working with countries, ministries and creating the capacity will be, I think the way forward, thank you. Um, no, Talahun, I think you're raising a very important issue there, which uh, I, I think uh, we all as a professionals need to take note of. Uh, these are very competitive uh, or competing approaches that are uh, thrown sometimes to the countries and uh, in the process, uh, uh, countries are attracted by you know, small funding uh, and they begin pursuing those at the expense of uh, their own national plans. Uh, they've got enough experts uh, to really you know, define very concretely what their pathways should be uh, instead of actually being confused by a whole range of uh, you know, new ways of uh, approaching to the changes. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's a very important point. Lulama? Uh, yeah, thank you, Prof. I know time is tight. So I just want to say, I mean, a lot for my key takeaway, and it's largely repeating what everybody else has said, is as an ag policy research institute based in Africa, I think our burden is to lighten the load on our leaders by really providing them timely, relevant, and accurate recommendations. And here's a key point that's fiscally feasible. A lot of times we give them a laundry list of recommendations that they just cannot afford. So we need to give them something that's fiscally feasible. So that's my closing contribution. Now, thank you very much, uh, Lulama. Uh, for, for that. Um, I, I think this has been a very e exciting uh, conversation. There are a number of recommendations already emerging and uh, we'll, we'll take note of these. Uh, now I, I want to turn to our uh, participants that are raising quite a, a few interesting questions. Um, one of them, and I, I believe there should be a lot of excitement from a, a lot of our colleagues working in the agriculture sector particularly in a, in a policy research institutions. Uh, this question is really directed to Kevin. Uh, the idea of establishing an African agriculture development fund seems interesting. What will be the underpinning mission and vision of such a fund? How different will such a fund be to avoid duplication of other interrelated funding uh, agencies? Uh, Kevin? Okay, um, thank you very much. I think the fundamental difference, uh, the unique feature of this fund, is it, is it being Africa-led, Africa-owned, and also Africa-run. Um, quite a lot of funding comes to the continent, and because of the research we've done, and also research done by CGD in the United States, we find that uh, the agenda setting is often influenced by the source of the funding. And then if the agenda setting is not fully aligned with the national development plans and the action plans, in, specifically like in agriculture, for actually agricultural transformation of that country, then it may bring generic, generic agendas that are not context specific. So this fund will drive context specific adaptive research processes within the, with the continent. And then the research agencies uh, will be part of shaping the agenda and so on, so that we will be able to mobilize resources at scale for Africa to be able to do the work that it needs to do. Just think about um, the huge amounts of resources that the World Bank, the African Development Bank, and other de development finance institutions have churned into the continent for hard infrastructure investments, building the roads, the ports, and all the things that we invest in. And these banks have done amazing work in mobilizing resources for that. 
But my concern is the soft infrastructure, which is this knowledge, the capacity development, the institutions that we need, building institutions and governance. We're all concerned about that, but how much have we really mobilized resources for that? So this is a call for us actually, we focus again on doing an excellent work in mobilizing resources for capacity, for institutions, for um, uh, individual and organizational capacity on the continent to be able to do development properly. So yeah. that, that's the idea. And it's out there for us to work together to make it work. Thank you. Well, no, thank you very much, Kevin. I think uh, a lot of us who work in uh, this uh, sector will be very excited uh, to look at uh, how that fund might be operationalized. And uh, I think the idea that uh, everyone needs to consider is that uh, this indeed would be African uh, conceived and African laid. Um, that's why I think tying it to African processes becomes extremely important so that there's buy-in from government ministers, uh, whether it's at the regional economic community level or indeed at the continental level, so that uh, these uh, African leaders also see it as their own fund and then call on partners to make a contribution uh, towards uh, that, that fund. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. And uh, uh, I think this is an issue that uh, we would be keen, I think all of us, uh, to take it uh, uh, forward. Uh, Thank you. you know, the, the other question, uh, you know, this is, a, what about successful innovations developed so far? How do we scale these to maximize their benefits? Um, Talahan, I mean, you, you are, uh, you, know, uh, you know, one of the scientists, I mean, who has been into generating innovations. I mean, how do we maximize, you know, those successful innovations yeah. that are known and scale them up uh, for the benefit of not just one country, but also maybe yeah. across the continent? Thank you. Um, this is um, an important question. There are so many technologies and practices developed by research systems, you know, national systems, CGR systems, and we rarely see them moving. And why they are not moving is one, because usually, you know, the technologies we develop are not really fitting into the demand side, you know, the farmer's demand, the landscape's characteristics, you know, and the economic uh, incentive they bring to the farmers. Uh, but also, you know, timing is always important. They don't give immediate benefits. Farmers rarely adopt them. So what, uh, you know, is now happening and how, farm, I mean, researchers are trying to do is, is one, you know, using, you know, tools that have been developed, GIS tools, remote sensing tools, to fine tune some of these technologies and, and identify targets where these technologies work. But also usually, you know, these technologies need other technologies to work, you know? So they don't work by their own. They may work, but they work only, you know, 10%, 5% yield increment. But we are talking about now, you know, linked technologies, two or three technologies coming together as a package. For example, a good seed, you know, a good appropriate fertilizer and a good water management system. And this, if you bring these three, by the seed, you may increase your yield by 30%, 20%, 30%. By water, probably another 30%. But if you bring three of them together, you may increase your yield by 300%. So the cumulative effect is always much more pronounced than what a signal technology can do. I think the last one is really reach. You know, are these technologies reaching to farmers? You know, do we have an extension system which can understand the technology and transfer that technology in good form with accurate information and target? So building the extension system is also very important. Thank you. No, th th thank you. Uh, th 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 thank you very much, Talahan, yeah, um, for that uh, response. Um, uh, another question. Uh, is do all small farmers benefit equally from agriculture laid growth? Are uh, there gaps in the ability of women and youth to increase their productivity, thereby decreasing the overall potential of age, uh, agriculture laid growth and their own benefit? Uh, again, this is actually looking at uh, you know, the, 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 the youth question. 
uh, and women, uh, you know, women's role in enhancing agricultural productivity. Uh, any responses to that question? And thanks, Richard. Um, uh, yeah, John? Think, oh, yes, uh, thanks for that uh, question. Yes, um, women and youth uh, face uh, several challenges, especially in access to inputs. And one of the things that has come out in researches that have been done on the continent relates to finance and the land, and land specifically for the youth to engage in, in agriculture and women uh, with finance to engage in acquisition of inputs. But not only these categories, but also um, uh, very poor uh, 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 smallholders that uh, may not have the capacity to participate in the markets, especially for inputs to produce marketable surpluses for them. So I think it is important to recognize that those uh, categories of uh, 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 groups are vulnerable in one way or another. And therefore there is need for support to them in terms of uh, providing some safety nets for them uh, in, in, in that space. But something also that uh, 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 we need to think about as a continent is uh, developing uh, 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 markets, especially output markets, um, looking uh, towards uh, uh, agro-processing and developing also marketing innovations. And uh, these marketing innovations is where really the youth can uh, get actively engaged in. And agro-processing is uh, a very fundamental to creating value uh, um, in the ag sector and creating also employment in the agricultural uh, value chain. Thank you. No, th thank, thank you, John. Th thank you, John. Uh, I, I think we, we are almost uh, getting towards the end. Um, I, I would actually ask maybe uh, for any takeaways from uh, uh, you know, this uh, conversation that uh, you know, we, we've been uh, engaged in. I mean, any last word from uh, each one of you? Uh, if you don't have uh, any last word, I mean, it's fine. Uh, maybe one minute each, I mean, uh, Kevin. Okay, thank you very much, um, Richard. I think my last words, uh, my concluding remarks would be, what we learn from this is that Africa is on the right track uh, with regard to increasing agricultural productivity, but we need to think more about, um, uh, you know, uh, agricultural, I mean, sustainable intensification instead of extensification. That's one key thing. And then the other thing is that investing in capacity is everything. We need to invest in institutional capacity in order to be able to make it work and that we can do it. Uh, we've seen examples in Africa of countries that are doing it well. So we just need to learn from each other and think home to build regional value chains, regional markets, regional technology hubs and so on. And we'll be able to make it work. And finally, that it needs partnerships, partnerships between African countries, between African institutions, and also global partnerships so that we can learn from each other in order to leapfrog and take advantage of being a late comer in this uh, uh, productivity uh, led agricultural transformation that we are looking for. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kevin. Um... Lulama, last word. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, for me, the last word is in a way repeating what Kevin has already said. We need to transition as a continent towards more productivity led growth. That's clear, right? And so we're going to need to be careful in the next 10 years to think how we're going to do this. And one thing for me, the key takeaway is we need to build our African capacity in order for us to amplify our voices in order for us to shape that pathway going forward. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I think my last word, uh, my final words would be, you know, I think, you know, 
the, the challenge we are facing is that we come once in a year, twice in a year, or you know, very you know, not very often, and then we start a new discussion. So, um, how do we make sure that we continue with discussion and come up with really you know context specific one voice for the continent? You know, where everybody, researchers and policymakers come together and adopt a strategy. And that's where I really want to go through Agra in our sustainable farming you know, approach. And uh, we'll be very, very keen to keep continue this discussion and organize forums. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, maybe in your, um, your last word, I mean, there's also a question on Ethiopia here, which says, uh, you know, Ethiopia is known to have one of the most successful agriculture extension systems in Africa, if not the best. What are the success factors other African countries can learn from? Yeah, <laughs> that's a very interesting, uh, we are not saying in Ethiopia that we have still achieved you know, what we want to do through the extension system. I think what the Ethiopian government has done was really making sure that they have special schools, no, not every agriculturist is an extensionist. Not every plant scientist or livestock scientist could be an agriculturist. So specialized extension agents trained and are supported by practice, but making sure that we are also bringing a livestock person, a crop person, a natural resource part. Yeah, that's the problem. What you call some word, you know, care we call it cavalry, a smaller small. So have at least four or five people, you know, available for the, the farmers to support them whenever they need as a need. But also that setting be supported by you know a knowledge base through guidelines, tools, so that they get and keep updated the information. Uh, so it's a work in progress, but really. The physical structure is in place and we are hoping that there'll be much improvement over time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, no, th th thank you. Th thank you to, uh, to, to Talahan. Um, yeah, I, I think we should uh, be moving on I mean, towards uh, the, the end. Um, I, I think my takeaway is that uh, th this is actually uh, work in progress. I mean, I think this discussion has been very, very productive. And um, I think my appreciation goes to the coalition of partners that uh, came together. Uh, and uh, clearly, uh, I would very much hope that uh, we will actually retain and sustain this conversation uh, that should feed into other forums, uh, whether it's uh, the ministers of agriculture meetings or uh, in Africa, or indeed uh, uh, the other global events uh, to ensure that uh, you know, we reinforce these messages particularly as we continue to engage African governments, uh, but more fundamentally, even within Africa, I, I think we need you know, to take advantage of uh, these opportunities that are already there, whether it's through the regional economic communities uh, or whether it is actually through some of these uh, youth movements uh, or whether it is uh, parliamentarians, again, who are very well informed uh, indeed, or indeed the media. Uh, how do we really bring all these range of our partners uh, to be part of our conversation uh, to ensure that, uh, again, uh, they are actually, you know, leading uh, in uh, responding to the opportunities that are, are evidently uh, available. Uh, but more fundamentally also, I think learning from South to South, particularly within Africa to Africa, for those countries which are succeeding and uh, ensuring that, uh, you know, these uh, governments speak to each other. Uh, maybe, you know, capacity strengthening, Kevin, one of the issues we may need to consider is also to look at a, a few of those institutions that are, are well capacitated and how can uh, other institutions learn from those institutions that seem to be doing uh, quite well. Um, now I'd like to uh, turn over to uh, Dr. Clara Cohen, uh, who serves as the executive director of the Board of uh, International Food and Agriculture Development, BFAD, and presidentially appointed advisor committee to the US Agency for International Development in the office of the assistant to the administrator, Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Um, she leads a strategic engagement with a BFAD to
to uh, apply USA higher education capabilities to USA agriculture development programming, and she guides BFAD's advisory contributions to agency decision making on feed uh, the future, the USA government's global hunger and food security. Uh, she's actually very well placed to really give us, a, you know, um, you know, a summary of uh, her takeaways from this very rich uh, discussion. And uh, we are very keen that uh, we uh, engage her and BFAD uh, going forward. So over to you, Clara. Great, thank you very much, Richard, and good afternoon, everyone. This has been an absolutely terrific session and a tremendously rich uh, dialogue with wonderful audience participation. It's really great to see how many questions this discussion has generated. And for me, I've spent a lot of my career working with the scientific community to frame messages and policy advice to government. So this has been particularly resonant uh, for me personally. So let me just take a moment to tease out what I heard as some of the main challenges and opportunities from the discussion. Uh, we heard about two major challenges. A first one being the need for productivity, for a shift to productivity-led growth. We learned from Keith that agricultural production growth has been a major driver of the remarkable economic progress and very positive outcomes in poverty and reduction in nutrition that we've seen in many countries in the African region in the last two decades. However, we also learned that this growth isn't uniform across countries and the growth path won't be sustainable because it's been achieved mainly through land expansion. Um, this is in contrast to productivity growth, which can be achieved through a range of investments, including agricultural research and development and an enabling environment for innovation, which includes things like extension, market access and infrastructure, macroeconomic policies, finance, insurance, land tenure, security and education. So first major challenge really is a, a more of a political economic one about how to nudge African governments towards these kinds of investments that catalyze productivity. A second major challenge that we heard was some around the limitations of institutional capacity among those local institutes of agricultural research policy that could be playing a greater role in helping to guide governments. A panelist told us that governments often uh, don't take the recommendations or are turning to outside groups for advice because of concerns about inter independence, credibility, neutrality, quality, relevance, and reliability among local institutes. So let's move now to the recommendations, which seem to cluster around four broad areas of opportunity. A first area of opportunity is to increase the emphasis on a country and regional approach to innovation, investment, and leadership using a systems lens. Richard uh, suggested that countries should work with regional economic communities and with regional, or Kevin suggested that countries should work with regional economic communities and with regional value chains to achieve synergies, to leverage and share international and homegrown, locally adapted knowledge and technologies, and to achieve the leverage that regional messages often have on putting pressure on the national governments. Uh, Kevin also said that we should focus on the implementation of already sound policies to garner more rents from growth that are coming to Africa. Lulama said we should not wait for donors to invest on countries behalf, but we should be increasing spending on productivity enhancing investments like R&D and extension. We should attain the target of 10% investment in agriculture and 1% of agricultural GDP in our DNA, perhaps uh, through an African R&D finance fund. The panelists also suggested that African governments should invest in an enabling environment for innovation, including a strong focus on development of trade-friendly policies, efficient markets, transport and agro-processing infrastructure, finance and market access, reducing risk to attract private sector investment, and inclusive systems for gathering evidence and decision support. Speakers also recommended farming system specific sustainable intensification uh, digitization and small scale mechanization approaches to build resilience in increasingly fragile environments and to add value. A second area of opportunity I heard is to crowd in new and powerful voices in evidence based decision making and advocacy. Panelists recommended continuing in engagement with policy research institutes, in institutes, but also more broadly mainstreaming, mainstreaming the involvement of non state actors and civil society organizations, including voices like the media, youth groups, women's and farmer groups, and strengthening their skills to use evidence-based approaches to develop relationships with decision makers, 
and to communicate clear, consistent evidence and messages to policymakers and implementers in plain language. A third area of opportunity is supporting partnerships between local policy research institutes and global institutes while strengthening the capacity and credibility of those local institutions. Partnerships among local institutes and global institutes that have proven their worth will be a critical part of the success of policy advisory systems and a key part of the approach to changing the quality of, to improving the quality of science. It's important to note that these should be true partnerships with partners collaborating on an equal footing. We also need to understand why governments often turn to outside groups for advice because of concerns about independence, credibility, neutrality, quality, timeliness, relevance, and reliability of local institutes. We should consider, donors should uh, consider building capacity to provide policy advice through a dedicated fund. And African and the onus should be on African led think tanks and other advisory institutes to demonstrate their value add to stakeholders. They also need to diversify their funding sources to prevent any one funding source from having undue influence. We need to frame the greater local relevance and adaptability of local institutes as an incentive to governments to actually use the recommendations. Finally, a fourth area of opportunity is promoting a culture of change for supporting institutional environments among government agencies that work across the food system. Panelists said that we should promote knowledge sharing and document and learn from optimally performing agencies and positive case studies like the ones that we learned about today in Ethiopia and Ghana. And as Lulama suggested, perhaps through the, the use of an African peer review mechanism to monitor our progress. We also need to lighten the burden of government agencies by providing evidence-based advice that provides fiscally feasible, affordable options. And we need to support and maintain adequate systems for data gathering to inform their planning and decision-making. Kevin talked about helping to relieve pressure on governments by de-risking financing schemes and to help find resources to increase access to capital and decrease the cost of capital to African-led institutions. And finally, we should be uh, supporting locally defined and generated national development plans. I, I want to end there and perhaps come back to Richard's idea of the coalition of the willing and hope that this group of partners and, and others who may join us may continue this work in partnership to exert pressure and to keep the momentum going even beyond this event. Uh, so as we close up the session, I'd like to give a round of very well-deserved thank yous. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the audience for your excellent participation and questions, um, very thoughtful questions. I want to thank our co-hosts, the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the Regional Network of Agricultural Policy Research Institutes, uh, Ramon Renapri, the Alliance for African Partnership, and the Board for International Food and Agricultural Development, or BIFAD, for their support and for their partnership in advancing these messages beyond. Uh, thanks to our amazing moderator, Richard Makandawera, you were amazing, superb. Uh, we really appreciate your excellent leadership and your thoughtful insights. I wanna thank our speakers, Rob Bertram, Keith Fugli, Lulama Traub, Tilahun Amede, Kevin Rirama, and John Olwande for your excellent presentations and for sharing your experiences and expertise with us. Thank you also to the BIFAD support contract staff at TetraTech, Carmen Benson, Mary Beggs, Carol Chan, Kenya Smith, and Gage Smith for your outstanding support and for keeping the momentum going. And we also would like to thank our wonderful tech change team and session moderator, Hilary Tacky. And many thank you, many thanks to also the AGRF organizers, including Lufingo, Mama Kamba, Catherine Ndungu, Katie Penland, and Robin Anderson. And hopefully I didn't forget anyone. Uh, this last slide in the deck, just as a note um, that, uh, uh, that AGRF 2021 continues tomorrow. Uh, the main sessions uh, begin tomorrow and we hope you'll join these sessions and look forward to continuing this dialogue throughout the week. Thank you everyone. And with that, I'd like to adjourn the session and wish, wish you all a very good afternoon and evening. Thank you very much, Clara. Thank you. And thank you to everybody. <laughs>